What are we going to do about Jim? Do about A man with his brain. Can you force him to live out his life as a beast of burden? Well, hang it, Bob. What am I supposed to do? He appears to be extremely intelligent. <laughs> well, that shows you. He's the dumbest one of all. There's a boy who just can't do nothing. His mind seems to be on something else. He's in another world, Ben. A world of his imagination. Uh, pure and simple wool gathering. No, no, no. I, I, I sent something else. Yeah, you do? <laughs> what? Power. Power? The power to move mountains. <laughs> it's all that boy can do to move his own two feet. He will move mountains. I can sense these things. Sono lieto di poter rievocare in poche parole le esperienze delle prime trasmissioni radiotelegrafiche a grandi distanze da me felicemente eseguite attraverso l'Oceano Atlantico il 12 dicembre 1901. Holy snapping bra straps. It's a podcast. Republic of Avalon Radio. It's zero hours Avalon Standard Time. Jimmy got his wish a few weeks ago when Uncle Bobby came to Long Pond with the W5 camera crew. There's thousands of you. Well, I'm glad you invited me up here because it's beautiful. What are you going to do when you grow up? Oh, I'm going to be a writer. Jimmy's in grade four at Long Pond's public school and doing well. But with only 9% vision in his good eye, he won't be able to continue. Newfoundland has no school for the blind, so in January, Jimmy will have to leave home and go to the nearest school in Halifax. But it won't be Jimmy's first challenge. He's optimistic. I think I'll never get over um, Miss Newfoundland, St. Terence Newfoundland, especially Lime Palm Annuals. I'll miss most of my things, most of my friends, and my mother, my father, my grandmother. And it's always the house, the ground I walk on, the ocean I can look out at. Maybe there's other children now watching Uncle Bobby and I on the beach. And um, if you are losing your sight, or you have bad sight, and um, you have to go somewhere, don't be scared. Please don't be frightened. Because, um, Although, you might not be in Newfoundland, you might be in Alberta, Toronto, British Columbia, anywhere. What I have to say is, just because you're losing your sight doesn't mean you can't do anything. Well, that's an excerpt from a W5 documentary on CTV that was done about Jim Fiddler when Jim was about nine years old. And now, we're due to have a full-length documentary on Jim. I still remember being produced by Jim's wife, Lillian. And Lillian joins me in the studio this morning. Good morning, Lillian. Good morning. Welcome to Weekend Arts Magazine. Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Now tell me, why does the world need an updated documentary on Jim Fiddler? There's an amazing story there. Jim's life story is quite amazing. I think it's uh, also a story of his music and where he's come, you know, in his life journey so far. 
as you know by watching the uh, excerpt from the W5 documentary, he was just nine years old when he had to leave home, leave Newfoundland, and, and travel by himself to Halifax to the School for the Blind. That was quite the event for a young person, so it was just the way he handled that and um, his experience in going to the School for the Blind and how his music evolved from there. The courage, I think, is a big thing as well, the courage and his inner strength. And I think that's something that has been with him all the way through. And it, and that's, I think, is something that would inspire people, also be a great encouragement for people. And to know, like, that this, this young person, what he went through, and now what he is and what he's done, and uh, the music that he's created, and also the message that he has to share with the world, I think is important and uh, certainly a worthwhile subject. What is his message to the world? There's a few things, but I think one of them is, you know, to be yourself and you can do great things, to be strong in the face of adversity, to be not positive in the think positive kind of way, but, you know, to value your own life, I think. To also stand up for other people and in the world that we live in, you know, make your life important. I guess those would be some of the things. I know there's a lot more, but I think he's always an encouragement to other people, and I've seen him over the years, really, to his friends and, um, you know, to other bandmates in school and to anybody, actually. He's been an encouragement and an inspiration, I think. He really does that in his music as well, and I think the fact that he does, you know, reggae music, that is kind of an outlet because it always has been you know, an outlet for uh, strength and encouragement and standing up for your rights and and that sort of thing. So that's, I guess, his love for reggae music is uh, partially due to that as well. Well, you can certainly hear in that little clip we heard his determination as a nine-year-old to to do whatever he wanted to do. Exactly. Nothing was going to stand in his way. Yeah. And he even encouraged young people his age who were undergoing, I mean, as a nine-year-old, he had that, that prescience to yeah. say, don't let anything get in your way. You can do it. You know, be strong. Just be you. That's right. Yeah. And that's that strength. Is, it's just amazing for somebody that knew that they had to get on a plane by themselves and go away from home and, and all their friends, their family, the place that they loved, which is Newfoundland. And he's always had a great love for Newfoundland. And not only that, but he was a very active child, you know, running through the fields and, you know, like any eight or nine-year-old and losing your sight and having to go away and you're taken away from all that and you're put into a a school, which was a great school, but it's still an institution. And it was a long way away from his family and friends. Yeah, so he didn't get to come home and, you know, only Christmas and and then the summer. And he, he really... Bucked all the rules while he was there. <laughs> <laughs> I have no problem believing that. His freedom was very important to him, so he really uh, found ways. And also, he started his first real group in uh, in school at the at school for the blind in Halifax. And just by saying to his friends, "Okay, I want you to play the guitar and you to play the bass," and so he gathered everybody around and. He would teach them their parts, and, and they actually went out and performed around Halifax. It was a 10-piece group of all blind kids. Amazing. Now, tell me why the name of the proposed documentary is I Still Remember. Well, right now, that's just a working title. Jim wrote a song. It's a, an instrumental. It's called I Still Remember. It's in the background of, of that little snippet on that you, you saw. Mm-hmm. He wrote it about his sister. He had a, a sister who, who actually died when she was very young. She was only three years old, I believe. The piece, he can see her in his mind playing, you know, in the yard and just the, the spirit that she was. And, and I, he wrote that piece about her. And the funny thing about it is um, we have this show called Republic of Avalon Radio, and we have a listener in Denver. And she runs a, a school, you know, a Montessori school. They have every morning like a little sit down uh, for the kids. Like it's a, a it's a period of, of quiet, and they light a candle, you know, to start the day. And she played this song. I still remember. And all the kids were very quiet. And after one of the kids came up, a little girl, and she said, "Miss Helen, I could see her 
I could see her playing, and they had no idea that this song was about a little girl. So that's, you know, the kind of thing that... The I magic think, of music. Exactly. Mm. It, it can paint a picture, which I think Jim does very well. Like, you know, it's like painting with sound. Well, now it's your job to paint a picture of Jim with this documentary. What are we going to see, and what's your plan for this documentary? My plan is to tell the story of his life so far. Uh, they say truth is stranger than fiction, and it truly is, I think, <laughs> in a lot of cases. And he's had so many interesting things happen in his life from, you know, going blind at the age of nine and having to leave home and the whole music thing and uh, honors at the Halifax Conservatory of Music and starting his first bluegrass band when he was just 12, which was quite successful. And apparently the manager ran off with their loot <laughs> and their money. <laughs> You know, he was just a kid, basically. He's learning lessons all his life. Yeah, and when he was in the School for the Blind in Halifax, they also made a, a tape at that time, it was, a full-length tape, which Jim wrote and produced the whole thing and had all members of the group from the school. And going right up to him, you know, forming a reg reggae band here in Newfoundland, why he did that, and then going off to meet his father for the first time when he was 22 and meeting him and realizing that there's music in the family, he didn't know. He, he didn't know about his father, really, until he was 22 and then met him. His father's family, they're all very musical. And, of course, his relationship to Christina Aguilera, who's his father's niece. And um, No way. Their first cousins, yeah. No way. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, Jim, Jim met this little girl. Uh, she was probably, you know, 10 or so when he met her. And she came out to sing for, for Jim. You know, she'd always been singing. And he thought, what a great voice this little girl has. So she, uh, Jim was already playing music himself and writing and everything. So, you know, he encouraged her as much as he could and that sort of thing. And um, turned out to be Christina Aguilera. So his, both of his brothers are very accomplished. One is an amazing guitarist. The other is an opera singer. And his aunt uh, traveled around Europe playing the violin at a young age. That's Christina's mother. And uh, So you're getting yeah. all this into the film. Amazing. Could be a two-part. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, to be yeah. continued. So there's lots of stuff. And his father's middle name is Marley, which he didn't know until he met his father. So that's another avenue that's pretty interesting. The reggae avenue. Yeah. <laughs> the whole coincidental thing. Yeah. It's and then, then there's the music. I mean, that's a huge thing in itself besides the actual personal experiences of his life. The development of the music and the different styles and the different influences and, you know, the cultural and world aspect of that as well. So there really is a lot to touch on, and I hope that I'm able to get all that across interesting and compelling way. Well, it certainly is an interesting and compelling story, so you should have no problem there. Tell me a little about the Indiegogo project, about how you're going about raising funds and what you're going to do with those funds. Well, the Indiegogo campaign is specifically to raise funds for us to travel to Halifax. The first part of the documentary that I'm working on is Jim's childhood, and specifically, you know, that, that's such a big part of it, going blind. So while I was working on this part of the project, I was interviewing um, Sylvia Thomas, who actually used to work with CBC at one time, and she's a very close friend of Jim's family and Jim's grandmother and knew Jim since he was a child, like since he was born, basically. And I interviewed her, and she is actually in that little snippet. About two or three days after I had interviewed her, we got a call from Jim's first music teacher at the School for the Blind in Halifax. And Jim hasn't spoken to him since he left the school in 1984. And they are unveiling a special plaque as a commemoration to the school because the school was torn down in 1984. And they're doing this on September 28th, and they want Jim to go and perform at this ceremony. It's important, I think, that he be there. And it's also what an opportunity for us to go there and for me to interview his first music teacher, some of these kids that were in the band with him, friends, uh, you know, to get a, a take on what it was like there, what, what it was like to, to be in that group, uh, some of the inspiring stories that I know 
are going to come out of that as well. So I think it's an amazing opportunity for us to be there and to record those stories that I know that are there. Once you get those stories, what's the next step in your project? On the timeline that I'm thinking of is the next step is possibly uh, getting into interviewing some of his family in the United States, in Pennsylvania, his father and brothers, and, you know, whoever I can possibly get. Mm. Uh, and also uh, when he came back to Newfoundland, you know, after, after Halifax and really got into the music scene here, which, you know, involved starting up the reggae group Pressure Drop and interviewing some people around that. So I think that's going to be my next step. Lots of people out there willing to come on board, and, and we've had amazing interest so far in the, um, in the project. I can't believe it. When we put this Indiegogo campaign up, if people couldn't contribute, they were sending us messages saying, what a great story, I can't wait, that's excellent, you know, uh, good on you, just all the way across the board. And we've gotten response and donations from New York, uh, from North Carolina, from Pennsylvania, from uh, Quebec and Halifax, and of course, around here. So, we, you know, it's far afield. I'm really excited about that, that support, and it, it gives us both a great lift. I was going to ask, how does Jim feel about this? I mean, does he have any reticence at all about being at the center of a documentary on his life? He sort of does, actually. I mean, it, he's basically saying to me, you know, this is your project, and I'm staying out of it. <laughs> 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 of course, I'm always now, because I'm doing this, I'm always, you know, really listening to things, you know, more, more so, because sometimes we'll be in his studio and he'll be talking about, it could be any subject at all, and I'm thinking, I wish I had my camera here now you know, because of what he's talking about. So at those points, I just make notes and think, okay, I got to remember to ask him about that because, of course, I'm going to have to be interviewing him as well on various subjects. Do you have an end date for, in your mind, even for for when the production will be completed and you'll be looking for someone to air? Is it going to be a film or are you going to think of it as being a television project? I'm thinking a television project, I really would like it to be picked up if possible and go as far afield as possible for as many people to see. I, I'm thinking it'll probably take a year. I'm hoping that next fall, that's my, you know, that's my date that I, I really would like to have it completed and ready for viewing. <laughs>
A Root Cellar production.